the river it has a tremendous force. It has an appeal about it that uh, I can't describe. But when you have people in a boat, to sense a kind of uh, the life that the river has, it's mind expanding for sure. How's the boat look? Yeah. It looks like a piece of artwork. <laughs> Built this boat in memory of Martin Litton because he deserved it. I couldn't be happier, I tell you. I was a little worried that I wasn't going to get this thing done to the last minute. <laughs> Got her finished. <laughs> The Grand Canyon is America's open-aired cathedral that holds beauty in the palm of, of its hand. No other landscape opens up deep time like the pages of a book and invites you to contemplate the implications of all of that time. Here you have this giant hole in the ground. And when you enter into it, and when you float through it, on the back of this legendary river that flows through its heart and that is responsible for having carved and created the thing in the first place. You are entering a hidden and secret world whose walls are framed by rock that is so unimaginably ancient that it's almost impossible for the human mind to grasp. And this happens if you spend enough time in the canyon, particularly if you're a boatman. I first saw the Grand Canyon in 1939. It never occurred to me when I first looked over the edge that I'd ever go on the river. Now, there had been trips, but they were considered very special expeditions, you know. You might as well go to the North Pole or something. The first time I ever rode a boat through the Grand Canyon was 1956. Commercial trips then were so uncommercial, they were like the small private trips you might see today. We were all sleeping on the damp sand right next to the river. Beaches went way out. I couldn't get enough of it. We always wanted the white water in the early days. In those days, though, nobody ran Lava Falls. It didn't occur to me to question that. And it wasn't until we had dories that we found we could run Lava Falls. <laughs> Whitewater dory is in many ways kind of, you know, the signature craft of the Grand Canyon. They're very responsive to the eccentricities of the current. Kick and ride and glide. Everyone knows the dories will take tremendously rough water. Then every once in a while something crazy happens and you get spanked down. They'll dump you and everything you own on the river into the water. just rolling along. <laughs> sometimes you know it's coming, sometimes it's a little surprising that it actually happens, I guess. Must say that the best part of it is just crashing through a great big wave, but not quite going over. From start to finish, somewhere around 1,100 to 1,200 hours, probably, building the boat. It's the little things that take a lot of time to finish a boat off so that we can take it on the river. There's a, a mystic thing about a dory. It has lines that belong on the water. There's a soul about it, a, a, a spiritualism almost. Those who come to dories never seem to go away. It's part of you. You kind of build a relationship with the boat. We've now been here uh working in Grand Canyon for, this is, I guess, our 43rd season. We all take great pride in the fact that we get to road dories down here.
We're at Lee's Ferry on the Colorado River, right below Glen Canyon Dam. I'm sitting on a brand new dory. <laughs> Duffy Dale has been working on it during the last winter, and as you can see, it's called Marble Canyon. <laughs> Ready to go. Yeah. Duffy Dale is the son of Regan Dale, who managed Grand Canyon dories for many years. Yeah, a lot of people think that we're like a, the mafia, because there's just so many of us, and we're always down here. <laughs> I think Duff was 12 years old when he first rode his first boat. How many trips you got now, Duffy? I think I'm at like 129. <laughs> he learned how to build boats from a young age, but now he's the master boat builder. Uh, my dad was building boats, and I learned a lot from my dad, so it almost gets me all teared up just thinking about it. Just have him get on the oars and say, it's a nice boat, Duff. <laughs> did a good job. He's quite the river guide now. Uh, and as you can see, he's built a beautiful boat to honor Martin Lytton. And we named it the Marble Canyon because he had a big influence on saving, basically, the Grand Canyon. We would be 100 feet underwater now because Marble Canyon Dam would have been built. There wouldn't be any river if the dams were built. I think it's a beautiful boat. He's here with me, so <laughs> feel it. The best way for people to understand how important it is to have the bottom of the Grand Canyon preserved is to have them on that river. Marble Canyon about to be flooding. Oh, river names. my river name. Well, I go by Moki, but later I be just became the king of the world. I have a business card that actually says Moki Johnson, king of the world. <laughs> my name's Rio Highbarger. I got to say the white water and being in a dory is my favorite part of being down here, for sure. This is where I work every day. Not too bad. Around 150 trips in the Grand Canyon. I think it does feel spiritual to me here. There's a real gentleness about the quality of this place. It's the first big rapid entering into Marble Canyon. It's a fun one. Not nervous until I get in my boat. That's when the heart rate picks up. My toast began to rise. There you see the dark red-brown rock all the way across the continent. Lost in the skyline, counting my sights. We were visions of the longest road. One of the really powerful talks that a lot of us do in Grand Canyon is at the Marble Canyon Dam site. Well, here we are in the heart of Marble Canyon. It was in the 50s that it was initially anticipated by the Bureau of Reclamation that they would build a dam here. And they did a bunch of ex excavations in this area to test the rock, make sure it was going to be strong enough and withstand the forces that would be created by putting a concrete plug across the Grand Canyon here. Well, Martin Litton stood up and said, no and got everybody on board with fighting this dam. And thank God we didn't, don't have a dam here today. As a boatman who rows a dory down here, the boat is your, your home. You sleep on it every night. Morning. Home for 110 days out of the year. And keep it clean. <laughs> Oh! 
Well, today was a very hot day. We hiked Deer Creek, we got very thirsty, and we figured we would toast Martin with his favorite drink, gin and tonic. Here's to Martin. Here's to Martin. He was born in, uh, in 1917, and he grew up in a world that no longer exists. I don't think anybody ever really knew all of Martin. One of the most unique people I've ever had a chance to meet. I was probably a little intimidated by him. I mean, he was a pretty famous guy at that time. One of the last great warriors, so much bigger than any of us. He just looked the part. It kind of looked a little bit like an Amish farmer that had gone to sea. And he had an eloquence he could sell shit to a cow. He was a pilot in World War II. He had a Cessna 195, and um, he saw from the air the emergence of this enormous reservoir that backs up behind the Glen Canyon Dam, Lake Powell. So I thought people ought to be reminded of what we have injured on this earth. Martin started the tradition of uh, naming the boats after wild places lost or compromised. And uh, it just makes you think about, uh, you know, what could have been or what should have been. What Martin did with his stories, that was poetry. We've been on the river for uh, oh, what, nine days now, we've gone on 10, 136 miles of river travel. And uh, it's been a great trip so far. down the road is a very large rapid named Upset! And I'm not kidding, but I'm not upset. Anyway. What's the name of that rapid coming up one more time? It's called Upset, which I'm not! closed out on us and it just went right over the bow and completely submerged the boat. If I wouldn't have high-sided, we would have been in the drink, swimming. <laughs> Upset. <laughs> it was good. Old Martin smiling inside the hatch. Yeah. <laughs> We're uh, more than three quarters of the way through the trip and Lava Falls is coming up tomorrow. There's a good dozen rapids down at the Grand Canyon that qualify as true humdingers. And uh, lava sort of distinguishes itself. This is the place where the Colorado River basically rolls over a set of enormous boulders and basically detonates. There's no guaranteed line through it. It's dynamic, and the, the scout, which precedes running the rapid, involves an enormous amount of discussion by the silverbacks. The whole key of this rapid is setting up to where you hit that lateral midway. So that little shoot to the left of the chub hole is what you're aiming for. But don't hit the chub hole. That's, that haystack's a hit. Yeah, it is a hit. Or the water. The one rapid where you know you could do everything right and still end up upside down. That's how it goes in the canyon, you know. Either have a story or you have a clean run. The last time Martin piloted a boat through Lava Falls came to wind up on the far right hand, which is not where you're supposed to be. Martin's philosophy about rowing dories was you kind of just point the thing where you think it needs to go and you just see what happens. The river's gonna decide he would get in these situations that would kill a normal person. He had some wild runs, but he acted like nothing happened. He would just kind of keep on going down river. He wouldn't even turn his head around to see what he hit. He'd just keep on going. The thing that everybody always said about Martin was that he rode with an angel on his shoulder. And he or she must have been on Martin's shoulder that day because right at the top of the rapid, we hit a seam of current that kind of shot us over to the left. and. By God, it put us pretty much exactly where we needed to be. Thirty seconds of frothiness and violence, and we were done. And uh, he did it beautifully. 
it was perfect. <laughs> Camped above Lava Falls. They can hear it in my background. Where's your heart rate right about now? It's actually a little elevated just because <laughs> we're like right there. I'll especially rolling this new boat through there. I'm gonna probably be more amped up than I have in a long time. It's lava morning, bright and early. <laughs> never fails to uh, get me going. So, yeah, big day at lava. trip is sometimes has been called the voyage of life. It is a microcosm of life. The challenge isn't so great at the beginning, and then it develops and develops, and you find yourself able to cope with it, and finally you've done it. You've done the whole thing. All things considered, a pretty darn good day at Lava Falls, and it, I'm glad it's back there, and we all got through cleanly. <laughs> Did you soap up, by the way, before you went in? No. You missed an opportunity. <laughs> no more rapids to run. And just basically had a golden trip. It means I didn't hit anything, I didn't flip. It feels pretty good. Do you think Duffy's a good boatman? Yes, no, yeah. Duffy's the worst. <laughs> How's that golden run feel, Duff? In fact, we were all golden, so we must be all as good as Duffy. <laughs> what do you think? You think it's sort of lucky that he got a golden run on his maiden voyage? Absolutely. <laughs> See this, this guy. Is this guy is a junk show. One, two, three. That's how we do it. Oh yeah! Hopefully, this boat can make it to 45 years. All right, Blake. Right. I'll probably be retired, some of you be rolling this boat, thinking about why it's here. It's really hard to capture what Martin Lytton means, especially now that he's gone. The dedication to saving these places, he fought like hell. He fought harder than anybody I can think of. Martin said, people ask me to be reasonable. Why would I want to do that? Reasonable people never get anything done. We don't have anybody like that now. He had outlived all prognosis by at least a decade. This little blip email comes in and it's from John Blaustein. It says, <laughs> Martin Lytton. And I just went, shut. And the day Martin Lytton died, in Flagstaff and some places in South America and Asia, there was a big earthquake. The whole house just explode, start shaking, and big bang noise. And I hear some crashing downstairs. And I said, that's an earthquake. And uh, went downstairs, and my globe had fallen off the shelf on the floor, my world. And I went, boy, that's Martin. We happen to be citizens of a nation that regards itself as exceptional. And the Grand Canyon suggests that we would do well to listen to the messages that nature and rock convey. If Martin Lytton didn't exist, you'd see a lot of people who are haunted by the idea that we took something extraordinary and we threw it away. Martin definitely knew that what we do down there changes people. And that's why he got into that line of work. 
but I still really believe in getting people out there in those boats. And it comes from Martin. He loved those boats. People uh, make quite a thing of how the Grand Canyon experience has changed their lives. How the experience has somehow opened their eyes to something bigger and greater in life. Who knows, you know, what life would have been like having gone another way. Somehow made my way into it and uh, I'm not the only one. <laughs>